Well, it's that time where we're going to transition to our time in God's Word. So if you have a copy, please grab it and turn over to Daniel chapter 9. Sorry, Daniel chapter 7. Uh, I have to be honest with you guys. Uh, the worldwide events this week have been troubling for me. They have been heavy on my heart, and I have been more glued to the news station than maybe any time that I can remember in my adult life, at least. I think it, there are times in our lives that we can remember where unique things in the world happen that, that we remember those days. We remember those days, don't we? You remember 9-11, September 11th, like it was yesterday, because it was tragic in our country. And I believe that what happened eight days ago is one of those days. It's one of those events. I'm not predicting anything, but I am saying this was a unique, tragic event that is the start of perhaps even more. We don't know what's going to unfold over the following weeks, months, maybe even years, but we do know that many, many, many casualties have already happened. Murders, uh, not just of men, but of women and children and infants, hostages, among whom there are many Americans. And I think that as the church, as the people of God, we should be concerned about these things. We should think about, Lord, how should I be thinking about this right now? Maybe even, Lord, where are you right now in the midst of this? And so I genuinely stepped back this week and thought, do we need to stop from our verse by verse and do a special message uh, to help us think through and even maybe if there's fear or uh, questioning to reason with the Lord from his word? But I have to be honest with you that I'm more and more than ever convinced of God's providence because as I stepped back and thought about that, I simply turned the page and there it is. And I really believe that we are entering into the back half of Daniel at such an interesting and poignant time. Daniel chapter 7 and the following chapters, friends, are what we need even as the world shakes over this past week. So again, let's turn over to the book of Daniel, and if you don't have a Bible, grab one nearby on a seat. You can have it. It's yours. Go to page 690, and we're going to be in chapter 7. And just as a quick reminder, Daniel chapter 1 through 6 are all of these incredible, powerful stories, right? Daniel in the lion's den, we just did last week. The three friends in the fiery furnace. I mean, unbelievable stories that demonstrate the power of God. But now, starting in chapter 7, the second half of the book is no longer chronological, and these are not stories. These are now visions or prophecies. Some of them will go back in time throughout the book of Daniel and show a vision or a dream that Daniel was given during this time. But the other thing I want to remind you is that Daniel chapter 2 through 7 is written in Aramaic because it was written to the world. It was written to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, about God's big plan for the entire world for all time. Daniel 7 is the final chapter in that big plan. And what we're going to find from Daniel chapter 7 is, again, God's sovereign power and ability to deliver. All throughout this book, and again in chapter 7, we see this phrase, the most high God. And loved ones, when we see that phrase that we've titled this series, I want you to think God is powerful and able to deliver. And I can't think of a time where that's been more pertinent than even right now. And so as we hone in our focus on Daniel chapter 7, and if you just look with your eyes at it, there are 28 verses, and it's really exegetically a simple breakdown. There's a dream. There's an interpretation of a dream, and then the final verse is a response to the dream by Daniel. But what I really want to show us is more than that, how this relates to us. And we're going to th see three big kingdoms, three big movements, if you will. We're going to look at the kingdoms of man. We're going to look at the culminating kingdom of man, which is actually the kingdom of the Antichrist. And then we're going to look at the final kingdom, which will be the kingdom of Christ himself. And what stands out for us from this chapter this morning is really a simple, big idea that is pertinent, and it's this. The king is coming, but first, the beasts. The king is coming, that is Christ, Jesus, who came once as a, as a lamb and will come again as a lion. He is coming again. If you're a new Christian, if you're new here back to church, newsflash, Jesus is coming back. 
But this time he's coming as a lion. And yet, until then, man must run his full course, if you will. And what we find from Daniel 7 is that man is described here as a beast or as beasts. Solomon said this over in Ecclesiastes 3.11, all men are beasts. And the carnage that follows when man steps out of his God-created purpose and into sinful rebellion is devastating, as we've seen even in the last week. Sin perverts that created image, the imago Dei, if you will, and now man seeks to steal, kill, and destroy just like the enemy of God. And so what I think this passage lays out for us is really an answer to the question, what do we need in a time of destruction? What do we need in times of terror, if you will, when man acts out in evil and wickedness toward one another? And the text lays out for us three needs, three spiritual needs for the people of God in an uncertain time. This is not the last time that something like this will happen. And so to prepare for what's to come, we're going to need three things. I'll give them to you up front and then we'll walk back through them. Devotion, discernment, and deliverance. I'm going to pull verses from throughout to package them around the three kingdoms. And so let's begin in verse 1. To prepare for what's to come, we'll need, number one, devotion when the kingdoms of man bring destruction. Look at verse 1, if you will, for a moment of Daniel chapter 7. It says, in the first year of Belshazzar, and if you remember, this is the king in chapter 5. So Daniel at chapter 6 was 85 years old. Now we're back 20 years. This was in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. And then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. End of verse 1. So again, this is the year 553 BC. It's chapter 5. And what follows in verses 2 to 7 is, I'm just going to say, animated. God wants you to see these beasts. He wants you to be able to smell them even, to hear them and their ferociousness. This is what we would call apocalyptic literature, a sign and symbol to represent something else. Let's give it our full attention in verse 2. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four beasts came out of the great sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth, behold, between its teeth. And it was told, arise, devour much flesh. After this, I looked and behold, Another, like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back, and the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. And after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns." Now, I told you, gear up. This is animated. And uh, maybe you haven't been in church for a while and you're thinking, man, this is different than how I remember going to church with grandma. Are we reading from the same book here? Uh, If you've never read this, this is a shocking vision, is it not? This is uh, un- natural or unnormal, if you will. But what is happening here is that God has given to Daniel a vision of the same kingdoms that he gave to Daniel or Nebuchadnezzar rather back in chapter two. If you remember back to chapter two, Nebuchadnezzar had a image, a vision or a dream of a massive statue. And the statue was made in grandeur and with splendor. There was gold and silver and bronze. But now this image, this vision is of that of beasts. And I think what's going on here is that chapter 2 is the same four massive kingdoms viewed from man's perspective. And at times we can look at the, the power and the glory and all the wealth of the nations and we can celebrate it. But chapter 7 is those same kingdoms as God views it. And no longer does God view it like man does as the grandeur and splendor of wealth and power, but as beasts, as beasts. From the 10,000 view, foot view of mankind, when we stray from our created purpose, men are wild beasts, savages, if you will, at times even inhumane. And I think that's what's being depicted here in chapter 4. 
These kingdoms are said to arise from the four winds of heaven, which means ultimately God is the one directing and orchestrating, if you will, this massive plan that is unfolding even amidst the destruction that the kingdoms of man bring. These nonetheless, though, are four massive empires. So let's look at them one by one. The first in verse four is said to be a lion with eagle's wings. And this is a description again of Babylon the Great. Babylon, that first worldwide empire that we saw back in chapter two that ruled from Daniel one to chapter five. The lion represents the ferociousness of Babylon. You can remember their vile acts from chapter one. And yet their wings represent the swiftness in which they would conquer. And yet in chapter four, chapter seven, verse four, it says they were made to stand on two feet like a man. And I can't help but think back to chapter four where Nebuchadnezzar was driven away from mankind, made to have a mind like a beast. It's called lycanthropy. For seven years, he ate grass like a cow and yet his reason returned to him. And thus, so did the entire empire's reason. There was an element of virtue or sensibility, if you will, civilness during that time. But we know that from chapter 5 to chapter 6, after the writing on the wall, the empire turned over to another. And verse 5 describes the bear with three ribs in its mouth. This is no doubt, again, a depiction of the Medio-Persian Empire. And yet the detail in verse 5 is that it was raised up on one side. So again, if you can picture this in your mind, there's this bear, but it's like got one arm that's up higher, one bigger side than the other. And this is a reference to the Persian empire being stronger than the Medes. And history, again, confirms this. The three ribs in the bear's mouth is perhaps the three other kingdoms that they conquered. Babylon, of course, Egypt, and a kingdom called Lydia. And the text says, arise and devour much flesh. And if you've ever seen any documentaries of the Persian Empire, you know this too was a violent empire. But then it moves into verse 6 with the leopard that had four wings. And I had to reread this because I'm like, is this a leopard with four wings and a bird on its back? It was a little bit confusing, but no, 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 that's not what it says. It says a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. Again, leopard and wings both represent the swiftness, the rapidness that the Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great would conquer. Bear in mind, this prophecy is given in 555 BC. Alexander the Great wouldn't come for 200 years, and yet this perfectly depicts how he would do it. It says the beast had four heads and dominion was given to it. And we know that while Alexander the Great died at a young age of 33, his kingdom was divided into how many? Four. Four generals under Alexander took the Grecian Empire into four parts of the world and eventually they were consolidated back into two. And then finally, there's this fourth beast, which is just called in verse 7, the fourth beast. But it is said to be terrifying and dreadful, exceedingly strong. And friends, this is the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire that eventually took over Greece. The Roman Empire that ruled during Jesus' day. The Roman Empire that would last until the 400s AD. And yet, what I think we find from this passage is that that same Roman Empire the spirit of it continues today. Though the empire official of Rome itself would succumb and fall, the ten toes from chapter 2 or here in verse 7, the ten horns, chapter 7, verse 7, it had ten horns. The ten horns represent that the spirit of Rome is still alive even today. And guys, this is where this matters for us. This is, according to Daniel's vision for the Gentiles for all of the rest of time, this is the world empire that we live in right now. We are approaching more and more the end, the culmination of the ten toes or the ten horns, the fulfillment of what Rome represents. And according to the text, what Rome represents is terrifying and dreadful, exceedingly strong, great iron teeth, and devouring and breaking apart one another. I mean, does that not describe the air of the times, if you will? This is the world that we are in. And friends, I I just want to step back and remind us of that for a moment. Not to get too comfortable in this life. Amen? Amen? We are not citizens of this world. This place is not our home. And so I have to say at times, shame on us for acting like it is. 
Isn't it easy to get lulled to sleep, to get comfortable over the years and decades of our lives, to get distracted by things like real estate and homes and boats and fun and entertainment and vehicles and jobs and 401ks and stuff? But the kingdoms of man are waging war of destruction against one another according to the spirit of Rome. And we need to clarify our true devotion in this time. Docs of Church, I want to ask you in a moment of honesty, what are you really devoted to? Because there's something that happens when things get unstable, when things begin to shake, when there's trials in your life or in the city's life or in the world's life. When trials happen, our true allegiances come out. Our true colors show, if you will. And I just want to ask you, honestly, before the Lord now, tune me out for a second, but listen. <laughs> what do you love? What is the thing that's in your heart that you long for more than anything else? What are you striving after week after week in your life? What are you devoted to? And I pray that no one right now is thinking about Taylor Swift. <laughs> if it's Taylor Swift, we've got a whole nother problem right now. What is the thing, though, whether it's honest and, and somewhat embarrassing or not, that you really care about most? Because when the world shakes, our devotion is challenged. This is what trials do. Personal trials, corporate trials, global trials. They bring about a sobriety and a humility and a dependency and ultimately a devotion to something. But what my prayer is, is that the Spirit of God would lead us toward what 2 Corinthians 11, 3 says, a pure and simple devotion to Christ. Amen? That we would be those with a pure and simple devotion to Christ. So again, here's the big idea. The king is coming, but first the beasts. And in the meantime, while that happens, we need more than ever devotion when the kingdoms of man bring destruction. This is what Daniel 7 is laying out for us. But the kingdoms of man, as I noted, are going to culminate now toward another kingdom. The apex or epitome of that. And that's second, that we're going to need discernment when the kingdom of Antichrist brings deception. In case the waging of war between man isn't enough, there is even more coming. Look at Daniel 7 verse 8. He says, I considered the horns... And behold, there came up from among them another horn, a little horn, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. Now again, if you're new to this, you've never read this, you're thinking, oh, it's just a little horn. What's the big deal? Not so fast. This little horn, friends, is a big, big deal. And just to clarify now, in the timeline, this is at the point where the Roman Empire is being replaced now by a single figurehead. And I believe this is still yet future, even from the year 2023. This is speaking of a coming time that the scripture calls the tribulation period, even the great tribulation, where it will be marked by this key figure, this key leader. So what's happening here is that in the midst of already wicked and corrupt nations and leaders, there is one little horn that will rise up that is even more so. These numbers of 10 and 3, according to verses 23 and 24, refer to 10 kings and 3 kings and their affiliate kingdoms. And the horn described here is clearly a man. He has eyes that were eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. This man brings peace and common sense. He's a talker. He has both an ethos and a pathos about him such that he's able to win over a crowd. But in the end, what we find is that despite his remarkable skill and even maybe scheme within wartime, this man is deceptive. In the end, it's a trick, if you will. It's deception at the highest level. If you look at verse 11, I'm going to skip 9 and 10 for a moment. We'll come back to it. Verse 11, I looked because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. So to clarify, this little horn is the same thing as the beast. He is the epitome of the fourth beast, if you will, that's described there in the earlier verses. And yet eventually his fate will also be death. Verse 12 continues, as for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season. 
And I think what this is saying is that at the turnover of the Babylonian Empire and the Medo-Persian Empire and the Grecian Empire, those people continued into the next empire. But at the end of this empire, the kingdoms of man will cease. Why? Because as we'll learn in a moment, the true king will come and establish the true and forever kingdom. Verse 15 now, again, we'll skip 13 and 14 for a moment. And I want to read 15 all the way down to 22. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious. <laughs> I wonder why, right? His spirit is anxious and the visions of my head alarmed me. Verse 16, I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. And so he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall rise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. And then I desire to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron, claws of bronze, which devoured and broke into pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And about, and about the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn that came up and before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things and that seemed greater than its comparisons. This is all review. Verse 21 is what's new though, look at it. And as I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the ancient of days came and judgment was given for the saints of the most high and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Looking at this Antichrist kingdom for a moment, verse 21 says that he made war with the saints. And you might wonder, who is this and when will this be? And again, if we stay focused within the context, it would seem that these are God's people during this tribulation time. The rest of scripture fills us in that there will be both Jews who become God's people through Christ, trust in Messiah, and Gentiles. And again, if you're pre-tribulation and your conviction, that means that the saints of the church have been raptured, but there are new Gentiles who have been saved. If you're post-tribulation, that means that there's Gentiles part of the church, along with Jews now that are believers. And in either case, there are clearly both Jews and Gentiles who make up, if you will, in verse 21, the saints. And yet it says that this horn, the Antichrist, if you will, prevails, he makes war with and prevails over them. This is to say the Antichrist will make life very hard for Christians in that time period, and specifically Jewish Christians. Verse 23 continues, thus he said, as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms. It shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. Again, speaking of the future kingdom of Antichrist. Verse 24, as for the 10 horns out of this kingdom, 10 kings shall arise and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones and he shall put down the three kings. And he shall speak words against the most high. He shall wear out the saints of the most high and shall think to change the times and the law. And they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Notice there, loved ones, that in verse 25, he speaks against Yahweh, the Most High. He persecutes and wears out the saints of the Most High, both Christians and Jews. And he shall think to change the times and the law. And this is clearly a reference to Judaism. He, his desire is to break the covenant, if you will, to stop all the Jewish traditions, the feasts they observe, and the sacrifices. And it says that this shall happen for a time, times, and half a time, which in the context of Daniel is a year, plus multiple years, which we find later to be two years, plus half a year. So three and a half years. And I'll submit to you that this is the back half of a seven-year tribulation time that is called the Great Tribulation, where things ramp up even more. Verse 26, though, describes his fate, this Antichrist figure. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. This man of lawlessness, if you will, that's later referred to in 2 Thessalonians 2, will also be judged, and this time it's in the court of God, in God's court. God is judge. His dominion will be removed. He will be consumed. He will be destroyed. 
So what does all this matter for us, though, right now? If you've tuned out for a minute, I want to ask you to come back in with me right here for a moment. What I'm submitting to you is that it's because of this prophecy of our future that we as God's people more than ever need discernment. We need discernment, friends. Why? Because this is the whole scheme of the enemy. The enemy seeks to cause terror, to cause fear, and it's a tactic to disillusion and eventually to deceive people. Fear is a tactic of terrorists for centuries, from political leaders, even governments at times, to make people desperate and deceivable. And when that deception comes, it usually comes with, here I am, follow me. This has been a tactic from communist governments, socialist governments for generations past, and it will be the tactic of the enemy in the future. This is why Jesus says in Matthew, if you want to turn there with me to the first book in your New Testament, this would be worth getting eyes on. First book in your New Testament to the right, Matthew chapter 24. This is precisely why in the midst of talking about the tribulation, beginning in verse 15, that down in verse 23 of Matthew 24, Jesus says, then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, what's he say? Do not believe him. I'm in Matthew 24, verse 24. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. This is the exact reason why Jesus warns us to be discerning. Likewise, the Apostle John, later on in the New Testament, in 1 John chapter 2, John says in verse 18, Children, it's the last hour, and as you've heard, the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know it is the last hour. There have been warnings for the past 2,000 years of church history since the time of Christ. But here's the lesson. Here's the takeaway. This is all culminating toward an even greater deception. All the deceiving of the last 2,000 years that the enemy has wrought on this land is culminating toward one figurehead, one deceiver, one antichrist. And we'll continue to learn more about this Antichrist in the coming weeks, but you need to know that he is controlled by Satan himself. He is Satan's puppet, the one who's called the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians 2, who will take his seat in the temple and call himself God. What we need to know as God's people even today is the deception does not only come with red face and horns. But deception can even come as one claiming to be a guardian, one claiming to be a, a deliverer, one claiming even to be a savior amidst a world that's being ravaged by war and famines and fear. It's going to be one who's well-spoken, who's winsome, who's a visionary. He's calm and sensible and powerful, and he even offers peace, deceiving nearly everyone. And this is why, loved ones, we are told over and over and over again, all throughout our, our Bibles, to be discerning. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 3, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Matthew 26, 41, he told them to keep watch and pray. And in Galatians 6, 7, Paul said, do not be deceived. Loved ones this morning, don't think for a second that this form of deception is not happening today and that it doesn't apply to you. It is and it does. We live, remember, we live in the time of the spirit of the Roman Empire, which means it's savage out there. A world that calls good evil and evil good. It's everywhere. A world that consumes one another and devours one another. And so here's the key. Now more than ever, we need discernment. But here's what discernment is not. Discernment does not mean that we need to be up on every hot take and every opinion. We don't need to know all of the news uh, outlets and every conspiracy theory. But what discernment means is that now more than ever, we need to be a people who know God and know his word. 
Tracking with that? We need to be a people who have wisdom that comes from above, that have spiritual wisdom and spiritual discernment, not the accumulation of facts and trying to figure out everything, but who know God and who know his plan and trust confidently in him. Amen? That's what we need more than ever. So real practically, this is something you can actually grow in. You can grow in wisdom. You can grow in discernment. There are three simple things that God brought to mind as I was prepping this that will help us. Number one is that we need to start reading our Bible every day. We need to be, as God's people, in a chaotic time in our word every single day. Number two, I think we need to meet with Christians for Bible study and prayer multiple times a week. I'll just call it two to three times a week. You should be talking about God's word with other people on a regular basis. And number three is that we have to be a people who gather together as a corporate body, a church family, every single week. We need to be in the word every day. We need to be with other Christians multiple times a week. And we need to gather at least once a week as a church family. And guys, I'm going to tell you, the majority of Christians are not buying into this. The average church attendance of Christians is one out of four times a Sunday. And I recognize I run the risk of uh, having a conflict of interest here as the pastor of this church. But I want to tell you, here's the reason why. Hebrews chapter 10. Do not forsake assembling together as is the habit of some, but all the more as you see the day drawing near. As we see the day drawing near with destruction and deception, more than ever, we need our church family. We need the word of God in our lives. We need to worship collectively the sovereign and risen king. We need God's help. Amen? Amen. So I want to ask you, uh, are you convinced? (laughs) Are you convinced that this is urgent? Are you convinced that this is a critical time in our lives? Guys, if we think this can't happen again, and I'm talking about what has happened eight years or eight days ago and what is continuing to happen, it has happened before, it's happening now, and it will happen again. The Bible says that things will get worse before they get better. Because of that, we have to be those who are increasing devotion and at the same time increasing in discernment. Final word on this is I think in Romans 12, it really speaks to both of these things in a fascinating way. In Romans chapter 12, there's kind of this cyclical, iterative process. Listen to the words here. Verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your spiritual worship. There's our devotion. We present ourselves to God sacrificially and for service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So let me, let me package this up for us. As the world around us shakes in destruction, we need more devotion to God and his word. And as our devotion grows, our discernment of the deception of evil around us will likewise grow. And as our discernment of that deception grows, it will feel more devotion. Are you tracking with me there? There's destruction. It ought to bring about devotion. Because of devotion, we grow in discernment. As we grow in discernment, we recognize deception, and it fuels, again, greater and greater devotion. That's what I think we need, guys. Here's the big idea. The king is coming, but first the beasts. And because of that, to be ready for that and equipped for that, we need to, number one, grow in our devotion to the one true king and his word. And number two, we've got to grow in discernment because it's deceiving times. It's deceiving times. But third and finally, we get to close with good and great and glorious news. Look back at Daniel chapter 7 if you're not there. To prepare for what's to come, we'll need deliverance and we'll get deliverance when the kingdom of Christ brings dominion. So from the kingdoms of man in this dream to the kingdoms of Antichrist, finally to the kingdom of Christ. Look at verse 9 of Daniel chapter 7. Daniel says, as I looked, thrones were placed and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames and its wheels were burning fire. What's going on here? Well, he looks and he sees these thrones. And I think this squares with the book of Revelation in chapter four, when the 24 elders which I think is the church, is seated on thrones alongside of the king. So this is God and his people that 
have thrones. And it says, the ancient of days takes his seat. And this is such, friends, I want you to think about this. This is something for your prayer life. God is the ancient of days. What that means is that his days are without number. He's the eternal one who has always been, he is, and he will always be, especially compared to all the petty kingdoms of man. He is the ancient of days. He takes his seat. He's not pacing. Amidst all the chaos and the violence and the destruction, God is not pacing. His clothing is white as snow, which represents purity, righteousness, holiness. The hair of his head is like pure wool, which again, is there's not a corrupt hair on his head. He's wise though. Gray hair represents uh, true, even full wisdom. His throne was fiery flames. This is the wrath of God and his eternal righteousness, his judgment going out to judge wickedness. And its wheels were burning fire, which means he's everywhere at all times. This is not a centralized judgment, but it is one that is everywhere. And I think that to comment on that for a moment, we can often kind of get a little bit uneasy when we talk about wrath or judgment or fire. But I want to ask you this. How about when you're looking at evil face to face? How about in the last eight days when you read about and hear about some of the atrocities of young ones And the way they've been treated, I won't go into detail because of the audience in the room now, but you know what I'm talking about. How about when we see that and we cry out for justice and we cry out for vengeance? Now, all of a sudden, the fact that God, while he's loving and merciful and kind, at the same time, he's just and he is uh, not willing that his name should be drug in the mud and he will extinguish evil. Now, all of a sudden, that is a praiseworthy attribute, is it not? That we actually don't have to be the ones to take vengeance, but vengeance belongs to the Lord and wickedness and unrighteousness will meet their maker. The text says, his throne is of fiery flames and its wheels with a burning fire. God's anger and wrath toward the wicked and evil is right and it is good. Verse 10 continues, a stream of fire issued and came out from before him. And then it says, look, a thousand thousand served him. My little engineering background, I'm like, okay, what's a thousand times a thousand? And it's a million. And then I got duped because look at the next line. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. Now I got to get out my calculator. This is a hundred million. That's not the point. The point is there are tons and tons and tons of people who have bowed the knee to Jesus. And what does it say? It says they stood before him and they served him. And the court sat in judgment and the books were opened. And so this is the courtroom of God. Mankind who have not trusted in Yahweh are now in the courtroom and behold, God himself is judge. He is the judge. Mankind is being prosecuted. The book opens, the verdict comes out. Verse 11 continues. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed. This is God's verdict going out. Antichrist, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. And as for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season of time. And I saw in the night visions and behold, with clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. Friends, if you're a Bible highlighter or you write in your Bible, circle verse 13 and verse 14. This chapter seven has been said to be one of the most important in the book of Daniel. And these two verses are among the most important in all the Bible. This prophecy is that there would be one who would come on the clouds of heaven. So again, from the courtroom, from the throne room to the courtroom, now to the clouds, there's a son of man, one who looks as man, who's born of man even, who came to the ancient of days, which is God. And what's given to him are things that are only given to God himself. Dominion, glory, and a kingdom. And then that all people should serve him. And loved ones, I have to tell you, this is a prophetic vision from Daniel 550 years prior to the coming of Messiah, Jesus Christ. 
You know that Jesus used this title for himself in the gospel records 70 times. 70 times Jesus referred to himself as the son of man. I'm the son of man. And what the picture is, is the one who will come on the clouds to be given all dominion, all authority, all power, and all will serve him. Jesus is coming, friends. Jesus is coming. And if we skip down now to our final verse that we've not yet looked at, verse 27, and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, and his kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Christ, as the coming Messiah, gets the kingdom, and you don't want to know what he does? He gives it to us. He gives it to his people, the saints of the Most High. Did you know you're, you're getting the whole earth, by the way? Matthew 5, 5 says, blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the what? The earth. Because of your connection with Christ, your relationship with Christ, if you've come to truly know him, you will inherit and rule over the earth with Jesus. And guys, the picture I want to give you, if you're already tired of the news, if you're discouraged, if you're fearful, is that universal worship of the Lamb, the one who came as a lamb and returns as a lion, universal worship is coming. All knees will bow to King Jesus, even those that are currently shaking their fist at him in hatred. Universal worship is coming, and it may be soon. It may be soon. For us, in times of terror and fear and wars, what we want more than anything is deliverance. We just want to be out of it. We want it to be done. And the encouragement from Daniel chapter 7 is that ultimate deliverance is on its way. True deliverance will happen. We have been delivered from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, but that's not yet fully seen as it will be. What's been accomplished at the cross will be seen, visibly seen in the coming kingdom. His return will be swift, swifter than any before. His righteousness will prevail, his judgment will be right, and his glory will be radiant. Evil will not prevail on the earth for long, but righteousness and goodness are coming with our Messiah. Isn't that good news this morning? Because of that, there ought to be worship and joy and even a sense of confidence and peace in us God's people. Verse 28 ends Daniel chapter 7. Here's the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarm me. I wonder why. Right? There's a lot of stuff that's going to happen in the centuries to follow. And my color changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. <laughs> Friends, like Daniel, do we understand everything of what God does? Quick answer, no. Do we know what's around the next corner of our journey of life as God's people? Quick answer, no. Do we know the details to the minutia, if you will, of how God's plan is going to unfold? Not in total, but we do know as much as he's revealed. And it's really a grace, isn't it, that God has given us revelation, prophetic revelation of what's going to come. I can't wait for two weeks from now in Daniel chapter 9 where I will show you how God calls his shot and fulfills it to the day. God is a God of prophecy, and he has given us a glimpse of the future to encourage us to build our hope, to build our comfort and peace and confidence and courage in the meantime. There's going to be increasing tribulation that will culminate in a great tribulation, but there is also going to be deliverance, deliverance through it and ultimately deliverance from it when Christ establishes his glorious millennial kingdom on earth. Isn't that good news? Hey, I've got time. Just a, a, one final thought here in conclusion, and it has to do with the church and the church being a safe and wonderful place. And here's what I mean. If you go back and read, and maybe jot this down for homework this week, Ephesians chapter two and three, what you find is that the church is a place where there is unity amidst incredible diversity. And what I mean is in the first century, there was an incredible tension, a feud, a hatred between Jews and Gentiles. And yet the church was the place where, according to Ephesians 2.14, the hostility wall was broken down. The division of 
of, of division, if you will, was mended and brought back together. The church then is a place where Jew and Gentile find friendship, companionship because of the gospel. And I want to bring that forward to today. What that means is that the church is a place where Jew and Arab find commonality and friendship. It's a place where Jew and even Palestinian find unity, community, even fellowship. And I think it's times like right now in our world that help us see the true miracle of what God has done in his church for whom Jesus died. That the church is a place that consists of young and old, rich and poor, black and white, every tongue, tribe, and nation under the sun that is unified not because of commonalities, not because of affinities or even stage of life, but that is unified because of the gospel. Because we have come to know our creator through the Messiah who died for us, that by trusting in his sacrifice for us, we would be set free. And that's the good news of the gospel. So friend, I just have to think that in the midst of the world shaking around us, maybe God's gonna bring someone to Christ. Maybe they're gonna see the hope of the gospel and the unity that the church uh, portrays to the world and find their Messiah. Maybe in the Middle East, maybe right here in San Diego, maybe in this room. But maybe second of all, one of God's purposes in all this is to again remind us and help foster greater commitment to the supernatural nature of the church. The church is the gospel made visible, friends. It is the hope when wars wage. It is the hope of the nations. And we are those who carry that hope in the way we relate to one another. So in closing, the king is coming, but first the beast. In the meantime, we need greater devotion. We need greater discernment. And we need to grow in eagerly waiting with hope for deliverance. Amen? Amen. Let's bow together in prayer.